Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today. Uh, this is Jason Key at SP Grid in uh, Boston. Uh, this is our weekly webinar series. But today, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Willie Riggers. So Willie is at uh, Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Norfolk Virginia, and uh, he is the developer of the CITUS package. And uh, today, he's going to be telling us about integrative structural biology with CITUS. Um, so go right ahead. You can do uh, share screen. Uh, if you have questions, you can send them by chat. At the end, we'll have some time for discussion. You'll be able to unmute and uh, ask your questions directly okay. if you like. Okay, great. Thank you so much for this opportunity, uh, Jason. This is wonderful. I've had really great experiences with SP Grid. Uh, I used to, you know, I'm sort of an old timer and I started on the internet in the late 90s, actually. And I used to do all my uh, services myself, you know, like interacting with users and uh, uh, training them and so forth. So this is definitely helping me reach out to the community in, in more efficient ways. And um, so um, one thing I would like to point out, I'm not sure what, if you can actually see me here or not, but I have a slide prepared with some information about myself, which are very quickly. Um, so I updated my picture, I have a lot less hair now than on the previous one that was posted on the website. Um, you know, uh, so I have a background in um, molecular biology, structural biology. I worked with Ron Milligan at Scripps uh, in electron microscopy back in the days, 1990s. And also I did a postdoc at UCSD at the time in San Diego. That's really where I started this research that I'm going to talk about today. So that was a long time ago. But uh, I then went to uh, uh, Texas Health Science Center in Houston. Um, and uh, after that to New York City, uh, where I worked with the Ishaw research for a while before I returned to an academic position currently at uh, ODU. Um, I prepared this slide here for SP Grid users because I've been told um, you know, um, you need to know where to actually find information about the package. Since the package is included in SP Grid, what's probably missing is the access to the tutorials and user guide and all that, and it's all online. So we have a main website for the current version 3.1 that's supported by SP Grid. Uh, tutorials, I will talk about those in more detail at the end um, of the talk, okay? So this is just an overview very quickly. Uh, publications, uh, individual manuals, everything's online. Um, I just want to point out that there's additional tools that are not yet in SP Grid. Uh, we call those CITOS flavors. These are variants of the CITOS program that are either experimental code or new tools that have not been fully integrated yet uh, or are still under development, sort of, you know, for better testing and so forth. So there's an extra uh, page for that. Uh, and I'm going to mention one of those CITOS flavors at the end also on one slide very quickly. Um, and since these are not in SP Grid, it's worth taking a look at that page maybe sometimes uh, to see what's there. Okay, fitting structures to cry maps That's sort of been the hallmark of my work in the last uh, two decades. And it's really an old idea that started almost 30 years ago. Um, with this paper published in Nature in 1992 by Jack Johnson and Tim Baker, where they fitted an, um, F an FAB antibody into um, uh, the uh, corresponding um, cryo-M density of a decorated virus capsid. So that the virus capsid decorated with antibodies and uh, the antibody structure was known in yellow and it was fitted by hand into the envelope, which is shown in, in blue. And it was really the first example of that type of fitting that uh, I could find and was published in Nature. So when I was a grad student in the 1990s, I went to a biophysical society meeting and other types of meetings like Gordon conferences. And uh, there was a lot of talk about fitting at the time. And um, my own work started in 98 with the CITOS program that I'm going to talk about. So that's been funded for more than 20 years now and uh, by NIH. And uh, so the first tool I'm going to tell you about is the Colores tool, which is historically one of the most important SATOS tools. Um, and it's still very widely used. Uh, it's a rigid body uh, tool that performs template convolution. So instead of giving you all the user guide details, 
I'm showing you the user guide at the end uh, as an overview. And I just would like to basically tell you about the functionality of each of those tools in, these, in the following slides. So you understand better what the tools can do and uh, find possible applications. And then um, if you would like to understand, you know, command line uh, input and output, Satus is a command line package, right? If you want to understand all this, it's best to actually go to the user guide and then uh, just copy and paste from the command line input that's uh, posted there. You can also do the tut tutorials, they, they give you step-by-step -step instructions. And I'm going to walk you through one tutorial at the end, okay? But now let's get started with Coloris. Coloris is a template convolution tool. And in this um, two-dimensional example here, I'll show you very quickly what it does. Uh, of course, it, this is a, just a schematic overview. What we want to perform is a, a search um, uh, for identifying the, the correct pose and position of a template in uh, a target EM map. So why is this not working? I apologize. Should be an animation. Now it's starting, okay. Okay, so you see what's happening. So we, we have a template that's being moved uh, in, uh, in scanning the position of, the, uh, of our target EM map. And then there's a possible match when the template overmatches with a, a, a structural region that agrees more or less with the shape. Um, and then we could just keep searching and we scan uh, translationally, um, you know, the entire volume in 3D. So this is a 2D representation, of course. We get possible matches. So then uh, as we proceed through this, um, in the next step, we have to perform rotational variations as well. So the translational search is implemented with fast Fourier transform. Um, uh, we use the FFTW library in Coloris, uh, and that gives us a very efficient way of implementing using the Fourier convolution theorem to perform the, the translational search efficiently. But the rotational search still has to be explored uh, exhaustively, and that is performed by uh, enumerating all possible orientations in 3D um, so this is just a, another possible orientation that's then being scanned. And you see that there's a better match, okay? Um, and then this better match is recorded and we save the angles and the positions as we are scanning the structure. But the second case, the match is actually worse and we don't save that information. And we perform with all possible orientations so until we actually have performed um, um, a complete rotational and translational sampling um, of the positions and, and poses of the templates. So this gives us then sort of a library or a result of, or, um, of better matches, and we can compute the cross correlation coefficient and rank the results by cross correlation. And I'll talk more about that in a moment on a, in a subsequent slide, okay? So just keep in mind that this is done in 3D with sophisticated numerical methods and um, and there we have six degrees of freedom, actually three translations, three rotations that have to be uh, explored. So uh, here's an application example of Coloris uh, from a recent paper uh, that was published by the group of uh, Philip van Petegem. They had a, um, a relatively low resolution map of Rhinodan receptor shown in, in white here. And that map had a resolution, I think 10 angstrom, 10.5 angstrom, right? And the uh, uh, task at hand was to fit a very small fragment, this very, very tiny fragment here that's color coded here into this very large map. So you can imagine that um, this is a very risky proposition, right? Because there's not enough interior detail to really guide the fitting here in this particular application example. Uh, so Coloris has some built-in filters that emphasizes surface matching, like the Laplacian, and I will talk about that momentarily. And they were able to dock this um, fragment, this color-coded fragment here into the map. And it later turned out to be at the correct location because a year later, um, um, a 2.1 angstrom uh, structure was solved. And um, no, sorry, the structure was solved at 3.8 angstrom resolution. So there was a, a much better cryo M structure that had a 3.8 angstrom resolution. Um, and, um, and that allowed them to basically trace the, the backbone and, and find the correct structure. 
So what the group of Van Pettigem then did was go back to the original Colores docking and compare their prediction, uh, which is shown in red with the blue uh, correct structure and uh, found an agreement of only 2.1 angstrom. So that is actually quite a respectable uh, agreement. And you see that the precision or the accuracy that you can get, um, it's not quite an order of magnitude better than the nominal resolution, but um, it's, it's usually a factor of five or so better than the nominal resolution to a factor of 10, depending on the quality of the map. Now in this case, because we had a very, very small fragment, um, the accuracy 2.1 angstrom was not perfect, but it's still pretty remarkable that we were able to, to identify this location. And they needed to actually use the Laplacian filter to find the correct match in that case. So what does the Laplacian filter do? If you don't have interior detail in your structure, a Laplacian essentially takes a density and turns it into a contour a surface in the interior it, it, with a negative um, uh, voxel intensity. So a positive contour in the negative interior then gives you information uh, about uh, surface details. And that additional information can be used for fitting and to make the fitting more accurate. Uh, and that's especially useful if you don't have interior details at very low resolution maps. So there was a very early um, tool we developed for low resolution EM, uh, but it, even today it's still widely used uh, for situations like that I showed on the previous slide, okay? So um, you can then perform a ranking of your fitting solutions and um, uh, rank them by the normalized correlation coefficient. And um, I want to point out this paper that was published in Nature by Tang and coworkers they've actually used this type of ranking to justify their Colores fitting. Uh, and uh, it's a really good example of, um, uh, you know, uh, how we can validate the results from Colores. So um, you see that the best case, uh, the best fit had the highest cross correlation coefficient. And then all the subsequent fits were spurious and had much lower cross correlation coefficient. So they gave them quite some confidence that the fitting was accurate. Now, there's some limitations to using the cross correlation coefficient as a ranking criterion. So you have to be careful there. If the maps are very low resolution, this docking contrast, which is the difference between the top and, and the, the first and the second solution, the correct solution and the spurious one might be actually relatively small. And it might even be the case that um, another highly ranked solution like number two, three, four or five, for example, instead of number one is the correct one um, in situations where you have induced fit conformational changes or steric clashes um, that are alleviated in the in the um, in the assembly, uh, so of course rigid body fitting cannot adjust the conformation uh, and avoid steric clashes. So if there are steric clashes present, it might happen that your top solution is actually downweighted and another uh, solution is upweighted, and then number two or three is actually the correct. Uh, results. So you have to be careful about this. Okay, so don't just use the ranking uh, alone because uh, cross correlation coefficients only tell you about the relative importance anyway. They don't give you an absolute number of certainty. Um, they, they're helpful, but uh, not in a strict sense, not in a rigorous sense, um, they, but they give you some good arguments in some cases, like in this example where you had a very clean result. Okay. Um, so what I the other effect is that if you use other approaches like Laplace and filter, multi-body fitting, which I show on the next slide, you get a different contrast profile. So this contrast profile doesn't always look like this. It might get a different profile if you use a different filter. So therefore you have to be a bit careful using the cross correlation coefficient for ranking, but it is useful in some cases to, you know, to provide some uh, additional validation to the fitting instead of just um, using the best result, um, it's useful to include that information. And, and for example, if you need to justify your result to reviewers uh, in a publication, right? So um, another approach that was later developed um, that was based on Colores is multi-body refinement. So uh, Colores only takes one fragment at a time, uh, but uh, it's actually advantageous to take multiple fragments, multiple um, domains, multiple subunits, and simultaneously optimize them into an EM map. So then uh, for each of those fragments, you have six degrees of freedom that gives you six N degrees of freedom. So that's a very high dimensional search operation. Um, 
it can be done. Um, and we have a tool for that that's called collage, but um, it can be done only in a non-exhaustive way because of this high dimensionality of the search space. You have the curse of dimensionality that basically precludes you from performing a, a, an exhaustive search if n is a very is a relatively large number. Um, if if n is larger than three, for example, it becomes you know impossible to perform an exhaustive search. So essentially, that means that we can perform the optimization only locally. You need to have a, a good starting guess. So if you have a good starting guess of your confirmation. Then you can perform, perform a six n degrees of freedom optimization and find good results using this multi-body uh, multi-fragment refinement. So the advantage of of uh, multi-fragment refinement versus one at a time is that the fragments now all see each other during the optimization. And you can avoid steric clashes, for example, and that happens during due to the normalization of the cross correlation. So this is the equation for the cross correlation coefficient. Uh, it's a product between rho m, the EM map, and the uh, rotated and translated um, atomic structure, rho calc. And the key here is the normalization. The normalization is of rho calc uh, requires you to that the rho calc density be spread out in, and to avoid steric clashes. Otherwise, this will give you a, a larger number and you would downweight the cross correlation. So uh, naturally, cross correlation coefficient avoids their clashes because the fragments see each other and that's advantageous. So then you get some situation like in this myosin decorated actin filament. Um, this is a muscle fiber and you see here the individual actin subunits and also the myosin S1 motor domains. They were all fitted with um, multi-fragment refinement and we could, could get very good result. In this case, we didn't use the helical symmetry. However, one of the advantage, advantages of um, multi-fragment refinement is that we can actually impose symmetry during the optimization also. So we can put symmetry constraints uh, into the refinement. Um, and that is all explained in the user guide of collage. Okay, so if you go online, uh, look at the user guide, you see options for imposing symmetry constraints. And as I mentioned, since the fragments see each other, the docking ac accuracy is improved typically versus using colores. Okay, so that was, uh, um, an approach that used not flexible fitting, but treating each fragment as a rigid body. And then uh, you had articulated fragments. So, so, but you see, we move away from rigid body more and more to uh, breaking structure down to moving parts. And of course they want, the extreme of that is that we perform full flexible fitting and that we now support inside those three. So that was recently introduced in 2018 um, and uh, in 2019, we we introduced this uh, DD Forge tool that performs a flexible fitting of atomic structures to EM maps using um, a damp dynamics approach that uh, does not require you to set up a molecular dynamic simulation. So it can be done in, within CITOS directly. Uh, and it's also fast. Um, it, uh, it solves first order differential equations instead of second order differential equations because we treat the dynamics as over damped uh, using essentially shock absorbers for you know, imposing the distance constraints. And there's a stopping criterion that um, prevents that, guy, you know, helps you um, against overfitting, that prevents overfitting. Because you can imagine that if risk refinement will continue indefinitely, you more and more approach the um, EM map, but the atomic structure will become, um, will be broken up by this approach. So there's sort of a, a sweet spot where you have a trade-off between flexible fitting accuracy and uh, integrity of the modeled atomic structure, which you want to maintain. And uh, that requires you to have some stocking, stopping criterion. I explained it in a moment. But first, let me explain how the damp dynamics works. It's essentially a force field that we introduced that takes an atomic structure shown in blue and fits it to unoccupied density in the EM map. So um, if there's some unoccupied density, the atomic structure is attracted to it. That's a force field. This is the um, structure of that force field. Um, that is, is essentially, you see this discrepancy here, the difference map between the M map and the model map. And we are essentially reducing the difference between the two. So uh, we perform essentially a difference mapping approach. There are also some weights and uh, schedules that are implied 
uh, which I don't have time to talk about. You need to look at the original paper, how it is implemented. But here uh, you see the effect of the stopping criterion. This essentially we look at the overlap between the EM and the atomic structure, uh, the MAP and the atomic structure. And you see that when we perform flexible refinement, after a number of steps, the uh, overlap does not increase anymore. So it saturates, okay? So uh, in the DD Forge tool, we have a, a yellow and a red uh, flag or a yellow and a red light that indicates when uh, you, you, know, you should stop your iterations because you, you're not refining the overlap any further. And the red light is clearly when there's an indication of um, uh, that you're overfitting. So these, these uh, yellow and red warning flags that DD Forge returns to you really help you avoiding overfitting and stopping uh, the simulation at the time when you have maxed out essentially the overlap here and you, you get into the saturation regime. Okay, so um, that is done by an analyzing this curve uh, with regression analysis and then that information is returned to the user. So the application of this is straightforward and I'm going to show you an example of this in the tutorial uh, in a few minutes. Now, I just want to point out some additional tools that Satos provides for 3D map manipulation and analysis. And these tools might actually be useful for you even if you don't want to perform rigid body or flexible fitting. So you see here in the damp dynamics approach, it's required that we account for all of the EM map with our atomic structure. Likewise here, um, in this movie, we need to look at the atomic structure and how the atomic structure is essentially fitted to the EM map uh, all of the EM map is being um, uh, taken into account by this fitting. So this requires you in many applications to uh, perform some difference mapping to find the region into which you want to fit an atomic structure. So here's an example of from a collaboration with uh, Seth Darst um, that we published um, 15 years ago. So it's relatively low resolution, but it shows very nicely the case that I want to make here. Um, you have two maps, a different helical symmetry. And one map was in the presence of a factor, grab B, and the other one was just a plain RNA polymerase without that factor. And due to the grab B factor, the helical symmetry of the assembly changed. And then it became really difficult to perform difference mapping. So uh, we had to develop tools that are now in CITOS to compute uh, difference maps, even if there are uh, different helical symmetries. And how this is done is shown here. So how do we register the maps? You see in red and in blue, the two um, RNA polymerase maps. And one has the additional density from the factor shown in blue here. But you see that it's a confirmation change between the two because of the different helical symmetry. So RNA polymerase is not identical in both cases. So rigid body docking gives you roughly the idea where the grab B is located, but it doesn't account very well for the conformational change that is shown between the red and the blue states. So if you want to take that into account, um, you can take a volume with a Satos Vol2 PDB tool, convert it to a PDB, perform a rigid body fit with Coloris, then perform a flexible fit with our flexible fitting uh, tools. In this case, we use Qplasti, which is one of the Satos tools for flexible fitting. Uh, today you would use DD Forge probably. And then we, um, after you have done a flexible fitting, um, uh, you can do a wall diff difference mapping uh, and then get a more accurate uh, density for this grab B factor shown in yellow. But it does require you to take into account the flexible deformation of the volume and that can be done uh, flexibly with, these, with this particular workflow, okay? I think we have explained this in more detail on a, in a tutorial also, but it, it's important you keep that in mind that we do this kind of map algebra. What we Essentially what map algebra means is that we are taking an atomic structure fitted to the density, um, and then we can subtract the corresponding density from the original density, as shown in this application example of uh, two myosin S1 heads uh, in tarantula muscle that we published with a role padron uh, at the time. Uh, the task here was to fit the atomic structure, subtract out this uh, corresponding blue part of the density, and then look at these regions, the uh, green region and, and the um, orange region, 
and then subtract those from the original map and then get an EM map that corresponds only to the atomic structure, which is this blue part. So then this EM map shown in blue can be used for flexible fitting because it's exactly identical to um, the parts that are represented in the atomic structure, except it still is EM based and has the conformational differences relative to the atomic conformation. We, that we're then able to perform flexible fitting with this approach. So this requires you to do this kind of subtraction and we do that with wall diff and wall edit. Um, and because wall edit is a tool that, uh, you know, allows you to do um, various manipulations of maps such as uh, cropping, uh, zero padding, flood filling regions and what have you. Also, what you can see here, we can tag a region showing green and, and orange flood fill it and then subtract that region from the density. That's all done with wall edit. Whereas wall diff is just computing the difference map, okay? So this should give you some ideas of what you can do with these tools um, as an inspiration. Uh, another tool we provide is wall hist that's performing histogram matching because when you subtract an atomic uh, density, atomically a simulated density from an atomic structure from an EM map, sometimes the, the density histogram doesn't quite match. And um, I'll show you some example of, of the problem that this entails in the next slide. But all his is essentially a histogram matching tool that uh, looks at the an overlapping region and then uh, performs a perfect match of the density histogram using a gain and, and bias um, approach. So we have just a, a, an offset and a scaling parameter and those two parameters are being fitted uh, to essentially get an ideal uh, cancellation in this cancellation zone, where the central peak of this uh, trimodal histogram here is centered, okay, exactly between the two surface uh, isocontour levels. So it's essentially a histogram matching technique that we developed um, for subtraction of densities. And you can read this paper uh, and uh, also the wall hist um, user guide for more details how that is done. Why is that important? I show you here an example. Um, these are positive and negative densities. Negative densities in red isocontours and positive densities in blue isocontours. And when we first subtracted the atomic structure from the EM map, um, we didn't subtract enough uh, initially in, in A. So when you then increase the scale factor and subtract more of the atomic structure, what's happening is that you get too much negative density, but there's still some positive density remaining. So you see that no matter how we we changed the scale factor, the subtraction was very sort of unsatisfying. So what we had to do in that case is not just to rescale the density, but also to adjust the bias, the offset factor using histogram matching. And then when we performed the difference mapping in point D, we saw that the subtraction is much better and there's relatively small differences shown in red and in blue remaining, much better than in A or in B, right? Uh, and these small differences are now due to conformational differences, okay? Uh, and that is fine, we expected those. But um, clearly we had to do this uh, histogram matching to get a better uh, subtraction here. And you see the effect of this in, in panel D. And that's all done with full hist, okay? Uh, another tool that we often use is for creating simulated maps. So you can uh, create uh, PDB structures from volumes, volumes or you can create volumes from PDB structures. So simulated maps where volumes are created from PDB structures are very useful when you want to um, uh, validate uh, fitting technologies to create some ground truths. Because if you know the actual atomic structure that you want to achieve in your fitting, uh, you can use that as a ground truth for evaluating your fitting algorithms. So we do that a lot in our evaluation and validation approaches. Um, so we can take an atomic structure, create from it a volumetric one and then perform the fitting again to see how well we do. This even works in situations where you don't know the atomic structure. You just take your model that you create and then uh, do the fitting a second time to the simulated map that is created from your model uh, to validate that the fitting is re reproducible. Okay, uh, here's just an application of this in our original paper where we use different types of filters. We looked at the root mean square deviation as a function of resolution and um, and that was all done with simulated maps uh, and it showed you very nicely how we can look at how filters affect the quality of the fitting, the accuracy um, 
but uh, just using the simulated maps uh, as a ground truth for this evaluation. Okay. Another tool that was recently introduced is Vault Track that performs alpha helix detection. It's essentially finding cylinder like templates in a volume and then performs a bi directional search and it finds these uh, central helical axes. We can then identify the alpha helices in an EM map, uh, perform secondary structure prediction um, in a high resolution EM map, like five, you know, or intermediate resolution EM map, five to eight angstrom, where you can see alpha helices and detect them and you see that they agree quite well with the known uh, alpha helices from the crystal structure shown in yellow here. Um, well, track is also very useful for tracing of net actin networks in Fulopodia, uh, these are tomograms. Um, so in tomography, um, we're looking at actin networks in cells shown in yellow here, and we're tracing them with uh, the Vault, Vault Track tool. Okay, it's another Satus tool that's actually quite useful and uh, widely usable in many applications. So we can trace helices, alpha helices, but also uh, filaments in, in um, tomograms. Finally, um, a tool I want to mention is the denoising tool. We have a wall filter tool for denoising tomograms and uh, cryo M maps, and that sometimes helps in fitting and tracing and uh, in inter interpreting the final result of a final volume. Okay, and this is my last slide um, today. I want to point out that uh, Citus is still being developed and what the, the topic I'm currently working on with my research group is uh, we work on uh, tomographic interpretation and segmentation. And in tomography, one of the sort of um, difficulties is not just that the data is very noisy because of the low electron dose that is required, um, but we also have a tilt series. So the specimen is uh, irradiated with electrons from different directions and a tilt series is being recorded. So that means we have low electron dose, so the results will are very noisy, but it also means that some directions, the tilt series cannot be complete, cannot completely cover all orientations. Some orientations are, are missing and that manifests itself as the so-called missing wedge uh, effect. So the missing wedge is in Fourier space, a region um, that is not occupied by data and when you look at the effect of the missing wedge in real space, uh, sh shown very nicely here in these uh, Philopodia um, uh, tomograms. Um, no, these are stereocilia, sorry. These are hair cell stereocilia uh, tomograms by Manfred Auer's lab at Lawrence Berkeley lab. You see very nicely what the effect of the missing wedge is because um, there's a missing wedge in this direction and it, pr and it basically fuses the actin filaments present uh, in the uh, cell uh, together into these long streaks. So this is an artifact uh, which we want to uh, filter out by denoising and, uh, and deconvolution of the tomogram with uh, templates that mimic uh, the shape of actin filaments. When we do that, we actually get the correct location of all these actin filaments and we get the true density uh, that's creating that, so those noisy and uh, and wedge convoluted uh, tomograms. So the true density then that we can get after deconvolution of the tomograms with um, with templates, cylindrical templates, um, uh, can then efficiently be traced with vault trace, for example, with tools like vault trace. So this is an active area of research. Uh, these tools are not yet in uh, canonical status, uh, which you can use an SP grid but they're gonna be soon available through Cytos. In the meantime, you can download them as separate standalone tools um, in the Conde package, which is a Cytos flavor on the Cytos website that I mentioned earlier. So now I'm done and I'm going back to the beginning. I mentioned other Cytos variants. Let me just click on this and bring up the web page. So here are the Cytos flavors and here's for example, link to the Conde program package that I mentioned for uh, missing wedge correction of filament tomograms. Okay. And you see there's a lot of other Cytos tools there, uh, Cytos related tools that we don't currently include in the canonical Cytos version that you get through SP Grid. So it's worth knowing about these, but they're not as well documented, I should say. Speaking of documentation, we still have a few minutes, I think. 
Um, so we can now um, perform, perhaps we can take any questions if you have some, and then if we don't have more questions, I'm going to walk you through the user guide and the tutorials maybe for a few more minutes. Any questions? So you can send a question by chat or we can, uh, yep. you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, what? I have one hand up here. Let me find that. Okay. Uh, Pete Meyer has a question. Yep. I'm, I'm wondering, could you say something about the, the idea about mixing the Laplace filters with uh, the B factor or low pass, high pass filters that people have sometimes used in cryo EM stuff? Like, is that, is that a bad idea intrinsically? Is that more trouble than it's worth? Or is it something that doesn't make theoretical sense? Hmm. Do you mean for resolution lowering? Uh, just in terms of if you're trying to enhance the the level of detail on the interior of density where it may ah. not be great. Okay. Now, one thing that I find, uh, one idea which we should really implement, and I'm working on this, is that we actually take into account multiple criteria simultaneously. There's been recently a paper... Um, I saw from a competing lab, I can give you more details. I need to look it up again. But they they actually combine different criteria into sort of a, um, a meta-analysis. And that's the performance of that seemed to be better than one criterion by itself. So right now in Colores, you still have to choose. Do you want to use standard cross-correlation or do you want to use the Laplacian filter? But uh, you don't have the, sort of the and, and, and you know the possibility of using a meta analysis. So that's something I want to implement, but it's not currently provided. I do find the Laplacian is a little bit dangerous because um, so you have to judge for yourself uh, it, because it depends on how much surface you have available. If you're only fitting to the inside of a structure and there is no surface to go off that is reliable, using Laplacian won't do you any good. Yeah. Uh, Laplace only helps you if you have a lot of surface details that you want to match in, 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 your, in your fitting. Um, but um, fitting to the inside of a density without having any reliable surface features is sort of a bit dangerous. So then it might be better just to use the standard uh, cross correlation without the Laplacian filter. And it depends also on the resolution, of course. If you see interior detail, anything better than 10 angstrom, you don't need the Laplacian filter. I think. If you had eight angstrom or so, you see, you know, alpha helices. So definitely use a regular cross correlation than in Colores. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I had a question, just just a general question about um, uh, volume to PDB. So I've looked. It seems like this. Uh, you just provide a volume, and uh, do you have to provide a sequence or any sort of what are the capabilities of the volume to PDB uh, ah. utility? I know that the uh, you know real space refinement and the sort of uh, you know you know map to model tools are in active development over at Phoenix, and they're working on all sorts of them. But uh, right. it's always a struggle for people well, to maybe, get. You know, maybe I should. We shouldn't be so. The, the, the name is a bit mis, uh, misleading because all we do is essentially take the map and we write every voxel that's not zero every non-zero voxel or any voxel above a threshold, if you want to select one, uh, is written to a, an atom entry in a PDB file. So okay. what is this good for? This is good for essentially taking the, or transcribing the map into PDB format. And then the density of the map voxel is saved in the B factor field, I think. Uh, either the B factor in the occupancy field of the PDB. So when you then reread, that map PDB into a Satos program uh, uh, for fitting, for example, Satos is smart enough to know that this is a PDB that was uh, generated from a map and it then reads the map densities. Um, what is this useful for? This is useful for fitting of a map to another map because all Satos tools for fitting require a PDB and an EM map. So if you want to fit two EM apps to each other, you have to first transform one to a PDB format for, for this to work. Uh, because the fitting will perform an interpolation, right? You, yeah. um, if you fit two maps to each other, the voxels will no longer be in register. The grid, the voxel grid will no longer be in register. So you have to break that registration by 
essentially transforming one of the maps to atomic structures so that, that is movable now to uh, any position and then an interpolation is performed at the end. Okay. okay. So, so this is the purpose really originally for creating PDBs from maps. It was uh, strictly for being able to fit maps to each other, you know, and then being able so, to subtract them. Because um, for difference mapping, it's of course important that the maps are in registration before you subtract them from each other. And, and so you need that as part of the workflow. But it's not as sophisticated as you might have thought that it actually can model automatically um, and create an automated model uh, from, so you still have to do the modeling in the workflow by using the individual fitting tools and then combine the PDB structures with other modeling techniques. Like I'm using RefMac for, ex for example, for refinement uh, often of, of the final models to reduce steric clashes and things like that. Um, so, you know, typically when structural biologists have other tools at their disposal and there's a lot of tools in SP Grid and you should use them um, and um, so CITOS only tells you where to put things, but the structures can still be refined later with other techniques, you know, like uh, RefMac, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was curious, just uh, or feeding. Having, yeah. having just taken a quick look at it. If, uh, yeah. uh, there was one question. Uh, I hope I did uh, disappoint you, but this, you know, this is the functionality. No, right? I, I, I thought maybe it was just something else because when I looked at it, I thought like, Mm -hmm. mysteriously it doesn't even require a amino acid sequence or anything i was wondering you know like you know how, yeah, yeah, how does this work you know yeah so where does the name uh Calorus come from uh from um low uh from uh correlation based low resolution docking okay yeah so uh, pablo chacon when he was my lab in you know almost 20 years ago he he coined that term and he, and it's also Spanish, right? So Pablo is from Spain, and um, it was really interesting because when Pablo wrote that tool, I, you know, he basically used var Spanish variable names for all the variables. So <laughs> I think we have anglicized the code now. But um, you know, it, that was a really great experience. He was the pioneer behind Colores, and he now has a very successful lab in Madrid in his in his own right. He's independent now but we're still friends we're still collaborating on occasion that's always great to read the when the code comments are in uh, non-native language that must make mm -hmm. for uh, interesting uh, uh wait interesting. i also recommend pablo has developed his own tool which is called alternative docking Pro protocol adp uh alternative to Citus. i don't know <laughs> uh, but he, and I highly recommend that people try out his tools also because um, in validation, it's helpful to try more than one fitting method, you know, um, to make sure that your results are reliable. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's uh, something we see a lot is people who are trying to find, you know, uh, on various cryo-EM data processing fronts, you know, which, which particle picker works best for their data, which... Uh, you know, which software works best? Are they, should they use, you know, GPU Isaac or rely on or which tools do the best job for their data set? So, Jason, do you uh, mind if I quickly show- No, go right ahead, the, please do. The tool manuals and then we answer the last questions. Yeah. So since I started this in the early nineties, right? And at the time the World Wide Web became, you know, popular. So I put all the manuals on the website and what you see here is still basically the structure from 20 years ago of the website. And of course it evolved over time, but you can click on one of the tools and it brings you down to the individual section. And then it explains how that tool is being used, the command line input, uh, what the output is and so forth. So we, I mentioned earlier, some sophisticated techniques like Colores, for example. Colores, uh, when you scroll down, see there's a lot to it because it's quite involved. So the, the more involved complex tools have a lot more usage uh, variability parameters that can be changed. So there's typically, and then I give the information about the parameters in two stages. I give some basic parameter information, um, which is what I basically explained in my talk today. And then there's more advanced parameter information uh, that is given underneath 
for the expert users who want to do you know detailed modifications. Um, the same is true for DD Forge. So you can use DD Forge, which is this flexible fitting tool, in a straightforward manner. Or you can be more sophisticated if you want to make manipulations. For example, you can perform, uh, you can freeze the secondary structure elements and perform a flexible fitting, keeping alpha helices frozen, for example. Okay. Um, there's an explanation of the, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, amino acids. So the amino acid model that we use, uh, all that is explained here and how we can constrain some of the internal degrees of freedom during the flexible fitting. So there are a lot of details there and possibilities. Um, it's worth exploring, but it's, it's, it's really much more involved than I can explain. But everything's on this single website. So you can go to that single web page and it's quite a long website, as you can see, but the entire user guide is here. And you just click on at the top, at the tool you want to access, and then it brings you to the location, okay, of that particular tool. Um, the other, uh, point I wanted to make, make is that there are tutorials available. So everything I explained today um, is really part of some tutorials typically. So for example, flexible fitting. Okay, so you see here the workflow for flexible fitting. Then you scroll down, it gives you examples of how to perform the flexible refinement with DD Forge. You see the iterations here. It's an iterative method that converges at some point and, uh, or you know, you get that yellow and red warning light and then you stop the calculation. You can use residue constraints, you visualize the results and then you can compare the flexible fitted result, uh, which is in green with uh, the original one that's shown in red, okay? Um, and the EM map is, uh, you know, in gray here in this visualization. So, but uh, the, Bottom line is um, the, um, there are tutorials for everything and uh, they're self-explanatory and I don't want to go through them because we don't have enough time. You know, there's quite a number of them. There's six of them here and they take maybe half an hour each and or more. So, you, you know, you can spend a whole day uh, teaching Sato's tutorials, you know, so uh, users are welcome to click through those tutorials and follow them uh, on their own time, you know, if they have the time, if they're interested in a particular area. Um, you see there's tutorials for small and extra scattering also, uh, multi-fragment, correlation-based, and the classical EM tutorial, which is classical Sato's one and two. And I mentioned the flavors already earlier, so that's it. Yeah, and so if you take a look at the website, yep. you see the you want to try out the uh, you know, the latest flavor. I was just looking at them here. You know, the Conda version two is up. Uh, you know, if if that looks like it's something that um, you could use in your research, get in touch with us. We can uh, get it installed. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, the uh, latest version of Citus, which I think is three revision two, I think. Or right. Yep. I, yep. Is available. It's. You know, it's fast compiled C. It's really, you know, it's right. worth trying. It's it's the help documentation is is good and it's there. So if you've got volumes to fit, it's a it's a good uh, yeah a good way to go. And um, thank you, you guys do a great job updating the software because revision two is very important because we b fixed some bugs uh, and uh, it didn't change functionality, but um, you know it makes the usage much better, more reliable. Yeah, so. I think. Um, it's one good thing about the sort of having a whole community of users is that uh, people let you know when new versions are available, when there are bugs, and you know. It's, uh, yeah, I was wondering how you guys do that with hundreds of how many software tools do you have now? You know, like four hundred or something. Wow. Four fifty or something. Yeah. So we have automated sort of web tracking that works pretty well. You know, I'm on about a million mailing lists, and wow. uh, GitHub repo watches, and uh, so. Uh, yeah, but uh, I'd say a good portion of it's also just users. You know, users just let us know, hey, this has a bug. This there's a new release, and you know, so yeah, uh, it's a it's a good mix of both. You know, of all of the different tools. So, all right, if there aren't any other questions, uh, I think we can wrap it up. Willie, thank you very much. These are uh, these are great tools, and I uh, uh, I'd like to see uh, make sure people know they're out there and available. And uh, 
I know a lot of people fitting cryo maps these days, so I'm right. sure uh, there's plenty of use. Thank you.